welcome everybody to um, a little late stocking filler uh, of a talk, um, carefully crafted to appeal to Russell's, <laughs> uh, Russell's interests. Um, I'm assuming that most of you here are familiar with the novels of Terry Pratchett. Go on, lecturing me. <laughs> <laughs> See, uh, this is this is this is the man himself who sadly departed uh, this veil of tears um, uh, three years ago. Now, for those of you who haven't seen the T-shirt before, this it's one he used to wear whenever he went to any kind of literary convention or whatever. Tolkien's dead. J.K. Rowling said no. Philip Pullman couldn't make it. Hi, I'm Terry Pratchett. <laughs> now, as you know, he wrote a long series of novels based on a fictional, semi-magical world called the Discworld. And towards the middle to the end of this series, in, the f in, in particular in the first, in the, in the book of The Fifth Elephant, um, he made reference to a system called, he called the Clax. And in a subsequent book, uh, Going Postal, this was developed much, much more. And the Clax is the Discworld's, becomes the Discworld's means of long distance communication. Prior to the introduction of the Clax, uh, the Discworld is in the same state as our world was in, say, 1750. If you needed to send a message, the fastest way of doing it was somebody on a horse. Okay. Now, the idea behind the clax is easy. It's a semaphore system. And uh, this, is, this is a... The working of the system is actually described in some detail in the books. This is a drawing of uh, a semaphore tower. And as you can see, it's got eight... eight little squares in it, shutters. And um, these are operated in groups. The towers are positioned a few, <coughs> some number of kilometers apart. The operator in the tower watches the tower down the line and relay puts the same message on their tower and so on down the line. Uh, I even found <laughs> this drawing. I don't think this book exists, which is a pity. I would like it to exist. <laughs> um, but as I say, the, the, the workings of the towers were described in some kind of detail. There is, in fact, um, the operator sits at a seat with pedals or something, I think, and there's a drum, a mechanical drum, that somehow records um, messages flying through. And um, actually, going back to the previous picture. And at night time, uh, lights are used um, to enable communication to continue. And the books describe this, uh, <coughs> the sight of the shutters flickering rapidly throughout the day. And you get this sensation of the hum of business information flying backwards and forwards. Now, coming back to our world, um, I, for those of you who went to the lightning talks last night, I mentioned this briefly. Uh, in the late 1790s, uh, this fella, uh, a Frenchman by the name of Claude Chapp, uh, successfully demonstrated a semaphore system for distance communication. The, the initial demonstration was over about uh, 20 miles. Or so. And this was in the era of revolutionary France, where um, the, the country was alive to new ideas and new ways of thinking. Um, sad, and his, his network was adopted by the government. Uh, his, his technology was adopted by the government. Um, and over the years, France built quite a substantial uh, network of towers. This incidentally is a statue of um, Chapp that used to stand in the Boulevard Raspail in Paris. Um, and you can see there, that's 
the, uh, that's the shape of his semaphore. Uh, he, he came to a rather sticky end, unfortunately. He got um, so ground down and depressed in trying to defend his intellectual property that one day he just simply committed suicide by jumping into a well. But, uh, anyway, so here we are, revolutionary France and then post-revolutionary France. Uh, Napoleon thought this was, this was a really good wheeze as well um, and carried on building out the network. Now what's happening here is you have a large cross beam and two arms at the end and they can assume a variety of positions. Um, whoops, hang on, let's, let's go to that one. Um, this illustrates the, the idea. The, um, certainly the initial usage was alphabetic as this indicates. There were a bunch of other control things we would recognize today as control codes and so forth. Uh, as I mentioned yesterday, backspace was a code <laughs> which could be exploited. Um, and here we have, this is the extent of the final network which operated up until 1853 um, and the only reason it closed down was because the electric telegraph had arrived and obsoleted it somewhat. Now, the network was only ever used for, highly for government messages and so forth. And basically, a government was the only body that was really rich enough to be able to run one of these things. Uh, because, of course, that's quite long distances. They ended up with about 550 semaphore towers like that. That's a lot of people to employ um, looking out the window and shuffling messages around. It was, incidentally, it was Sharp who coined the words semaphore and telegraph uh, as well. Though, in, in, in fact, actually, he, he, he initially wanted to call it a, um, tele something else, but a rather more learned classical friend of his corrected him to telegraph. Now, Obviously, these doings did not go unnoticed on this side of the channel. And in the, uh, the start of 1800, the Admiralty in Britain decided that they needed a faster means of communicating from Admiralty in London to the major ports. They had a little competition and selected, the winning design they selected was this. Um, it's uh, due to a, a Reverend Lord Murray. And as you can see, when I first saw that, I thought, oh me, that's a clax, isn't it? Um, the system was, uh, was built very quickly. All the, nearly all the sheds were just rough wooden constructions. They only really intended to use it temporarily during the war. And in fact, after the minute the Napoleonic Wars finished, the whole network was torn down. So none of it survives today, uh, which is a pity, but there we go. Um, and again, it was alphabetic based initially. This is a picture of St. Albans High Street in 1805. And you can see that's one, of, that's one of the stations on the top of the tower. Uh, that's a bit too small to see. That's um, a quick summary of uh, the codes. Each station took three men to work it. You had somebody staring out of the window at the upstream. Uh, station with a telescope and then two men, one operating each side uh, of the shutters. And, hello. Um, good point. I'm not entirely sure. I'm not entirely sure. I haven't found much in the de much detail about how these things were operated, actually. Um, you could definitely send messages both ways. Uh, but I think that, actually, I think there was a signal saying you were going to reverse direction, something like that. Um, and with this system, you could send a message from London to Portsmouth in half an hour. 
or so. Um, probably not a very long message, but you could send a message. <laughs> and this is going to talk more about that in a moment. And we ended up with, uh, this, is, this is the network here. The first line to be built was from London down to Deal. Um, uh, and then that was followed by uh, one to Portsmouth uh, the, uh, and Great Yarmouth. Now, one of the interesting things about this is that I said they were all ripped down after the end of the Napoleonic Wars. And with the, um, with the foresight that the uh, British military always displays, they realized fairly soon after, the Admiralty realized fairly soon afterwards that actually they were jolly useful and they were missing them. So they built a second network, rather more permanent one this time. And you'll notice that this time they went for a semaphore system rather than the shutter system. And this is interesting because one of the things that Claude Schapp had done before launching his design was an extensive series of tests on visibility of different mechanisms. And he'd concluded that, in fact, shutters are not very visible at distance. Semaphore is much easier to see at distance. The other thing that uh, Schapp had done, and which uh, British found out themselves independently later, um, was they'd tried experimenting with transmission at night using lights attached to the semaphore arms. And it just didn't work. Uh, it was, again, it was too difficult during darkness to, to accurately get a positional information off the lights. Because, uh, of course, we have to bear in mind that the lights in those days would have been um, probably rather dim oil lamps or whatever. Anyway, this is the one surviving uh, tower from the, sec from the second system. This is in Surrey. Um, and it still works, um, amazingly enough. It, it was, um, the building was um, uh, restored in 1989, and as part of the project, they did, uh, re they did restore the mechanism as well. <laughs> and one final little thing. I said that the systems were alphabetic. In fact, actually, they fairly swiftly switched to using a coding system. Uh, for two reasons, first of all for um, uh, security, but actually mostly for information density. Now I've got the next slide is an example of um, a code that was used later on electric telegraph. Okay, where again, each word that you sent cost you money. And people uh, developed huge code books of uh, which enabled particular types of message to be sent in a very compressed format. This is the, uh, this is what I might call the ciphertext, which is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine words. That is the deciphered text. Flower market for common and fair brands of Western is lower, with moderate demand for home trade and export. Sales, 8,000 bushels. Jeunesse at $5.12. Wheat, prime, it, it goes on for ages. <laughs> so, unfortunately, my takeaway from investigating all this has been the clax is a lovely idea. And perhaps it might work on Discworld. It's, Pratchett specifically said that it wasn't a magical system. And of course, Discworld is covered in magic. Um, but unfortunately, it probably just doesn't quite work well enough for our world. Um, the, even the semaphore arms and stuff, it took a while. You didn't get a very big, your bandwidth was pretty limited. <laughs> I think you got about a character a minute or something if you were really working hard. But uh, anyway, and yeah, again, the British network operated until 1847, I think, when again, um, it was shut down because the electric telegraph 
had arrived. The first electric telegraph in Britain started operating between Paddington Station and West Drayton in 1838. But, uh, anyway, so I'm sorry to be the bearer of bad news. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, um, I hope you've enjoyed a little diversion. I just have to say, GNU Tony Pratchett. Yeah, <laughs> GNU Tony Pratchett. Is there um, There's yes, there are. Uh, there's a few towers that do, and and bizarrely, a replica tower in Germany. Um, as well. The statue of, uh, sadly, the statue of Schaff in the Boulevard Raspai um, was taken down in 1942 and, and, uh, and melted down. But his grave um, still exists, his, you know, his grave fairly obviously still exists, and that has a model of his um, semaphore system above it. It was a great, in fact, semaphore systems of various different designs spread quite a way around Europe. Um, the French had by far and away the most developed one. Well, well, I, as you can see, the, the French network. Um, don't know if I can go back here. Uh, the French.